Welcome to SCOTUS Cast, Death Sentences, Dangerousness, and Parole Edition. Thank you for tuning in. On May 31, 2016, the Supreme Court decided Lynch v. Arizona without oral argument. A jury convicted Sean Patrick Lynch of first degree murder, kidnapping, armed robbery, and burglary for the 2001 killing of James Panzarella. The state of Arizona sought the death penalty and, before penalty phase began, moved successfully to prevent Lynch's counsel from informing the jury that the only alternative to a death sentence was life without parole. When the first jury failed to reach a unanimous verdict, a second jury sentenced Lynch to death. After that sentence was vacated by a state appellate court due to errors in the jury instructions, a third penalty phase jury was convened and again sentenced Lynch to death. On appeal, Lynch, invoking the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Simmons v. South Carolina, argued that the trial court's refusal to allow mention of his ineligibility for parole violated his federal due process rights. In Simmons, the court stated that, where a capital defendant's future dangerousness is at issue, and the only sentencing alternative to death available to the jury is life imprisonment without possibility of parole, the due process clause entitles the defendant to inform the jury of his parole ineligibility, either by a jury instruction or in arguments by counsel. The Arizona Supreme Court rejected Lynch's argument and affirmed his death sentence. By a vote of 6-2, to two, the U.S. Supreme Court reversed the Arizona Supreme Court's judgment and remanded the case, holding in a per curiam opinion that the Arizona Supreme Court had erred in its attempt to distinguish Lynch's case from the situation in Simmons. Justice Thomas filed a dissenting opinion, in which Justice Alito joined. To discuss the case, we have Mara McLeod, who is an associate professor at Notre Dame Law School. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. And now, Professor McLeod. Lynch v. Arizona is one of seven death penalty cases decided by the Supreme Court this term. The case centers on how life or death sentencing choices must be presented to the jury. Lynch had been charged with capital murder, and at trial the prosecution suggested that Lynch remained dangerous. And so Lynch's defense counsel, to eliminate the risk that the jury would sentence Lynch to death because it feared his release if he were sentenced only to life in prison, sought to waive Lynch's right to have the jury consider a release-eligible term. Defense counsel also sought to have the jury informed that Lynch had no possibility of parole. Indeed, Arizona abolished parole for adults committing their offenses after 1993, and Lynch had committed his capital crime in 2001. The court, however, refused defense counsel's requests, instructing the jury only that if it did not sentence Lynch to death, the court would impose a life term, either with or without the possibility of release after 25 years. The jury chose death. On appeal, Lynch presented numerous challenges, including an argument that the court's refusal to allow his counsel to advise the jury of his parole ineligibility violated his right to due process under the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Simmons v. South Carolina in 1994. In Simmons, the court had held that when state law gives the jury only two sentencing choices, death or life in prison without parole, the defendant has a due process right to have the jury advised that he is ineligible for parole. The Arizona Supreme Court initially did not reach this Simmons claim because it remanded on a different state law issue. But the case came up again on appeal, and the second time the Arizona Supreme Court addressed and rejected Lynch's Simmons claim. It read Simmons narrowly to apply only when state law makes a defendant ineligible for early release. Here, in contrast, Lynch was eligible for early release. Though as a practical matter, parole had been abolished and release was unlikely based on the alternative of executive clemency. The U.S. Supreme Court granted Lynch's petition for certiorari. It dispensed with oral argument and summarily reversed. Its per curiam opinion held that Simmons governed and required a death case jury to be instructed whenever a capital defendant was parole ineligible. 
regardless of whether clemency remained a long-shot option for release. The court rejected the state's arguments for exceptions based on hypothetical future developments, such as clemency or legislative change, recognizing that such exceptions could swallow the due process right. Justice Thomas dissented, joined by Justice Alito. He emphasized that Lynch's jury had been properly instructed on state law. The judge had advised the jury that if it did not sentence Lynch to death, the court would impose a life sentence with or without the possibility of release. Just what state law prescribed, even though Lynch had little chance of release as a practical matter. Justice Thomas contended that the court majority was imposing an extra-constitutional magic words requirement on state courts, rather than simply requiring them to accurately present state law. His dissent expressed more than disagreement with the application of Simmons to Lynch's case. Justice Thomas reiterated his longstanding disagreement with Simmons itself, in which he had joined the dissent by Justice Scalia, arguing that whether to advise a jury regarding parole eligibility is an evidentiary matter properly left to the judgment of the states. And Justice Alito notably joined Justice Thomas's dissenting opinion in full in Lynch. Now, there are a few really interesting things about this case, and I, I have time to mention just a few of them. On the substance, I want to explain just a little bit more about what was different here than in Simmons versus South Carolina, since the majority here in Lynch treats Simmons as dictating the result, and the dissent disagrees with Simmons itself. So we have no opinion explaining how Lynch might have been decided differently without overruling Simmons. In Simmons, the jury had been advised that its sentencing choices were death or life in prison and was told by the judge to give life in prison its plain and ordinary meaning. And the jury in Simmons had asked the judge whether parole was possible, but the judge had instructed the jury not to consider the issue of parole. Now, at the time of Simmons' trial, South Carolina had a system of parole, and a survey conducted shortly before Simmons' sentencing had found that most people thought that persons sentenced to life in prison would be released after a few decades. So there was reason to think that Simmons' jury believed that Simmons was going to get out on parole. And the prosecution had expressly put his dangerousness at issue, arguing that he would be dangerous. In fact, Simmons was statutorily ineligible for parole based on prior crimes of violence, so he was not getting out on parole. Under those circumstances, the Supreme Court concluded that due process gave Simmons a right to correct the jury's understanding. In Lynch, the parole system had been abolished years earlier, and the jury had been advised that there was no chance of any type of release before at least 25 years. So Lynch doesn't reflect so much a need to correct a likely jury misunderstanding as a right to protect against any possibility of jury confusion on the question of parole. And I'd also like to highlight a different and interesting aspect of the case, which is how it comes up under due process rather than the Eighth Amendment. In Simmons, Justice Souter contended in a concurrence that because the Eighth Amendment requires heightened reliability in the choice of a death sentence, a jury should be instructed whenever a defendant is ineligible for parole, regardless of whether dangerousness is at issue, in order to ensure that the jury appreciates the true severity of a sentence of life in prison as an alternative to death. So the Eighth Amendment really focuses on questions of desert, on ensuring the jury makes an informed retributive judgment, and not merely on ensuring the jury properly assesses the risk of future harm. So it would be very interesting if the court will take up that additional Eighth Amendment question in some future case. Now finally, I want to briefly highlight how Lynch represents part of a potential trend in the court's willingness to reverse state criminal case judgments. And the court has expressed increasing willingness to reverse decisions on appeal from 
state post-conviction proceedings rather than waiting until after federal habeas review. We saw that in Foster versus Chapman, uh, which is another capital case that came out earlier this term. And when reviewing in this manner, the court is more likely to reverse because it's not bound by the constraints on review established by Congress for habeas claims under the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act. And the current court has also been summarily reversing in capital cases with some frequency, doing so twice just this term, the other case being Weary versus Kane. Now, both Justice Thomas and Justice Alito have very vocally resisted these trends. They've argued for greater deference to the state courts and have objected to the court's willingness to reverse without giving the parties a full opportunity to make their case. And their opinions point to very deep tensions in the approaches of the justices to federalism and the court's proper role. So Lynch really is important, I think, both as to the sentencing issues it directly addresses and as to these overarching jurisprudential issues that it implicates. It's going to be very interesting, and for some people, I think, very concerning to see how a new justice steps into these controversies. Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUScast. For more episodes of SCOTUScast, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at www.federalistsociety.org slash multimedia.